Thanks for joining us. I'm Nancy Furness and this is We've Got Issues. We're filming on site at the Coquitlam City Centre Library and we'd like to thank the library for allowing us this venue to uh, hold our interviews. I'd also like to acknowledge that the interviews are taking place on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of Coquitlam First Nation. We thank the Coquitlam people who continue to live on these lands and to care for the lands and the waters and all that lie above and below. So today we're joined by Nicholas Sperling, who is a BC Green candidate for Coquitlam Millardville. So thanks so much for joining us today, Nicola. Of course, thanks for having me. I'm wondering, no, this isn't your first run for the BC Green Party, so can you just give us a little bit of an idea of the mandate, maybe some of the operations of the BC Green Party, and how it differs from NDP and BC Conservatives? Of course. So I think a lot of people know the Green Party as being very environmentally conscious, and that's certainly a big aspect of who we are as a party. We're also a party that cares a lot about every aspect of governance. And um, when it comes to the differences between the structures of the parties, I think there's one key difference between the parties that attracts me to the Greens, and that's that we don't whip our votes. So for your audience, I don't know if, if they're all going to be if aware of what that explain, means, of course. That would be great. Thank so you. a whiffed vote means that there's a few party insiders that dictate how all of the candidates for that party or how all of the elected officials for that party are going to present themselves and are going to vote in the legislature. So I think that's really important because in a campaign, we all make promises to the people, mm -hmm. right? We all say, this is what we're going to do if we're elected. And then when we get elected, what we or when we elect a party, what we see is that they don't always do the things that they say they're going to do. So the benefit of having a party that's not whipped is that every candidate fully intends to keep their promises. And when they get elected, they actually have the freedom to make those promises happen. Mm. Whereas when a party insider says, no, 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 we don't actually like this party promise anymore, they can go around to all of their MLAs and say, I know you might not actually believe in this stance, but you're either going to do what we tell you to do or you're, we're going to kick you out of the party or we're going to make your life really difficult. And that's why I prefer to be with the Greens because I don't want to have a party insider saying, no, you're not allowed to keep your promise to the people of Coquitla Mayardville. Right. So it makes it maybe challenging sometimes to truly represent your constituents as opposed to sort of what we call towing the party line. Mm -hmm. So I uh, thank you, I appreciate that, um, that explanation there. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, now we're talking about democracy and mm -hmm. voices being heard. Um, we don't have proportional representation right now, so when we end up with two good candidates in the same riding, sometimes voices get lost. We mm -hmm. don't get to hear everyone's voice. The Green Party has proposed something called a citizens' assembly. Mm -hmm. Can you Talk a little bit about that. What is it and what's the goal of it? So I think just in a basic uh, form, what a citizens assembly is, is a group of people from the province of BC or, or from a specific riding perhaps that help to inform the government on the path forward. And I think that that's really important because when your politicians get elected, they're supposed to represent your views, not right. their views, right? They're supposed to represent all of the people in, in a riding or all of the people in the province of BC. And that doesn't always happen, as we just talked about with party insiders calling the shots. Right. A citizens' assembly sort of flips that on its head and says, let's give the power back to the people. Let's let the people make the decisions around what's going to happen in this province. Let the people help craft the legislation that's going to have an impact on their lives, right? I, that's a really interesting concept. And how would these citizens be chosen? Are they selected by the party in power or are they randomly selected? Mm -hmm. I think in a lot of citizens' assemblies they are randomly selected and um, there obviously has to be work done in order to make sure that they're representative right. of, of the province, right? It, we talk about that when we're electing people to the legislature, we want to make sure they're reflective of the, the demographic of British Columbia because that way all these voices are heard. So the same thing applies to a citizens assembly. You want that to be reflective of, of the province. I don't know specifically what the party's plan is when it comes to that, but right. um, just from my understanding of citizens assemblies in general, that's typically how they work. Okay, I want to um, go back to, you had mentioned that the Green Party had an environmental mandate. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. As far as the Green BC Greens have said that they will 
not support any further fossil fuel infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We know that right now we are dependent on fossil fuels. How are we going to make that transition away? Right. So, I mean, this isn't even about transitioning away. I think naturally, as a society globally, we're transitioning away from fossil fuels. So that's just naturally happening. Okay. And the reason that we're talking about stepping away from investing in expansion of fossil fuels is for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense to throw a lot of money. And a lot of the money that's being thrown at this is taxpayer dollars, right? So okay. the money that we all work really hard for is being sent to huge corporations that are expanding fossil fuel infrastructure and they're telling us this is going to be profitable and this is going to pay off. You just have to stick with us for a hundred years or something right. like that and then it's going to be profitable. But the reality is that as we transition away from fossil fuels, they're going to become less and less profitable. So in, in my mind and in the party's mind, it makes far more sense to put that money towards new and emerging economies that are actually going to be profitable for this province well into the future. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I've learned something more. Um, I also want to talk about axe the tax. Mm -hmm. We're hearing this slogan. We've heard it from the BC Conservatives who have said they want to axe the tax, both federally and provincially. Yep. And now we're hearing from BC NDP that they are willing to um, axe the carbon tax. Can you talk to us a little bit? What is the carbon tax and why have the Greens not... Um, change their mind? Why are they still supporting a carbon tax? Right. So uh, in its simplest form, a carbon tax is essentially putting a fee on the use of fossil fuels if, if you're doing it at a very large scale. So okay. this is trying to address the biggest polluters in our society and figuring out how do we incentivize these people to find more sustainable ways of operating their businesses. Right. It's not a tax that is negatively impacting the average citizen. Okay. It's negatively impacting these larger corporate that are heavy polluters and it's actually giving back to the average mm -hmm. citizen mm -hmm. um, and the BC Greens don't support carbon tax as like a general blanket rule right we right. support it if it's revenue neutral and so that means that it's not being used as a way of generating income for the government for various ah, services okay. it's about being net neutral and right. and so it's really just about making sure those big pollutes polluters, excuse mm -hmm. me, are not polluting as much as they are. Right. Uh, what I find really strange about the NDP's position on this is they understand this issue very well, mm -hmm. but they saw that the Conservatives were saying, axe the tax, and they saw that they were using this information to rile people up around what this actually means mm -hmm. and how this tax might be affecting them. You're paying a ton of money at the pumps, right, when you're filling up your car. Well, you're not. You're paying a few cents, maybe. But... The reality is that the NDP are in this for political gain, at least that's my perception of it. And they view the Conservatives as getting positive attention for saying, let's axe this tax. And so they're flip-flopping on it. Right. And we've seen this happen with a variety of issues. We've seen it happen with involuntary care as well. And we'll talk and about that. In a we'll we'll bit talk about too. that in a little bit, yeah. exactly. But um, that's kind of my perception of, of why they've shifted positions. But I think the carbon tax, if it's implemented properly, can be a useful tool. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think there is a little bit of confusion around the carbon tax, and so thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. um, Nicola, you are well known and well respected for your work um, advocating and being a voice for the LGBTQ2 plus community mm -hmm. in the Tri-Cities and beyond. Um, if you are elected as the MLA for Coquitlam Millardville, mm -hmm. what would you do to reduce the stigma or um, marginalization of that community? Right. So I think as far as reducing stigma and marginalization, a lot of it starts with education. Uh, okay. A lot of it starts with making sure that people understand who people around them are, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it's part of what SOGI education is in schools, and we hear a lot of rhetoric around SOGI education, but really all it is is uh, it, it's a, a method of making sure people in schools understand the world around them, the people around them, the diversity around them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really big part of the equation. Uh, I think there's also a gap in our BC Human Rights Code when it comes to social condition. Okay. And I just learned this recently in talking with Pivot Legal Society. They said, did you know that social condition isn't protected by the BC Human Rights Code? And I said, no, I, I, I didn't know that actually. Oh, interesting where you find the gaps. Exactly, right? Yeah. And I spend a lot of time working on having gender identity and gender expression protected. And I thought, okay, well, what's the next hurdle that we have to get over? And it seems right. to me like that's one of them. And uh, that applies primarily to people who are homeless or houseless, right? right? But it also applies to queer people quite generally because 
they are primarily uh, or a very large demographic of the homeless or houses population. Oh, okay. So there is multiple issues there. Right. There's a lot of intersectionality mm. when it comes to that. And uh, also, in my conversations with our elected officials, when they're putting forward legislation that impacts or potentially impacts queer communities or really any community, right. they should be informed about the people who that's potentially going to be affecting. Well, but absolutely. You would think that's, that's a basic yeah. requirement, right? They're out in their ridings, they're talking to their community. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem like that happens. I mm -hmm. participate in an initi initiative uh, twice a year where I send out information to all of our MLAs and I have conversations with them at the legislature. And I say, what you should do, go into your riding, talk to one trans person, right. see what the issues in your riding that are affecting them are, bring that back to your party. Bring that back into the legislature. Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're keeping that in mind when you're crafting legislation. And a lot of times I get a response back going, I don't know a trans person. How am I supposed to talk to someone if I don't know them? And I oh, said, well, so now it's time to get out there and meet some of these folks and, and right. have that conversation. And I mean, I think it's a huge issue. If you don't oh. even know one trans person in your writing, that's like saying, I, I don't know a black person, but I'm going to put out legislation that affects black people. Or I don't know a homeless person, but I'm going to create legislation that affects homeless people. You know, it, it affects like everything. If you even think about health care, go and talk to the doctors and mm -hmm. the nurses and the people on the front line. So in any community, um, I think that applies. That's a really good principle to to go by. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. that that also combines with that education piece, right? Yes. They need to be educated the way that they educate themselves is by having conversations with communities. And as politicians, we should always be out in our communities talking to people, right? I thought you were going to say that the community needs to be educated, but our elected representatives also need to be educated. Absolutely. So thank you for Everyone that. needs to be educated. Yes. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about another um, community that's vulnerable and marginalized, and that is the unhoused. Mm -hmm. um, we've heard recently some very harmful and hurtful comments come from Port Coquitlam City Councillors about this issue. And there, this definition came out about unhoused people saying they are simply people who don't want to work. Is that true or is there more to the story here? No, that is fundamentally incorrect. And I think those types of comments are despicable. Um, I think that that counselor, speaking of education, needs to educate himself mm -hmm. much better because people can become homeless for so many reasons or, or unhoused or um, I know there's a lot of terminology that we use around this, but right. um, people can find themselves in hard times for so many different reasons. It could be because they become sick and they can't work. It could be because um, the affordability crisis has gotten so out of control that yes. even working at one job or multiple jobs, you still can't pay We're the bills. that more and more. Right, right. There's, there's so many reasons. And to, to mm -hmm. boil it down to this person's lazy and they don't want to work, I think is right. just absolutely horrible and dehumanizing. Um, so where have governments failed in this. Like we've have been dealing with this and seeing this situation for a long time. It's not mm -hmm. a new thing. Where have we failed? Uh, with regard to housing in particular? With regard to all those interconnected crises, and I'm sorry, this is it's <laughs> not a broad be question. An easy <laughs> question, but if we're talking about unhoused population, um, drug crisis, mental health crisis, um, everything is all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Where have we gone so horribly wrong? I mean, I, I don't know if that's a question that I can answer in its entirety. I don't know that anyone can answer that question yeah. in its entirety. That's but I think fair enough. That's when it comes one. to affordability, there's a lot of measures that the government can take. I, I want to focus maybe first on housing sure. and just say that when it comes to housing, we have a lot of people that are coming into this province. Right. We have a lot of people that are using property as an investment. And we need to figure out how to free up as much housing as possible for people and not just free it up but also make sure that it's affordable housing. So the BC Green Party's approach is to build 26,000 units a year in Great. order to make sure that we're creating that new housing and also that we're using public lands and using um, properties that are maybe underused as a way of freeing up space that can be created. So this is a way to kind of um, bear those costs more equitably and um, to have a real pragmatic approach to mm -hmm. housing. Is the housing crisis, um, by just simply building more houses, are we going to address the affordable housing crisis? 
Well, I don't think building more houses on its own is going to do it, mm -hmm. right? If you build a whole bunch of houses and then a bunch of investors come in and snap right. them up immediately, that's not going to work. But if you build actual affordable housing, and I'm using a BC Housing's percentage-based uh, approach to affordable housing, I believe right. it's like, uh, thirty percent of your income should go to housing. I know very few people that are actually putting thirty yes, percent of their income into housing. They're putting like forty, fifty, sixty percent. They're maxing out and doing without other things that they should be spending money on as well. Right, and I found that my, uh, found myself in that position for a while as well, where. I was having to sacrifice things like medications that I needed or sacrificing eating healthily, various different sacrifices that you shouldn't have to make well, just to put a roof over your head. further complications and, and further expenses to everybody when that happens, right? right. That's not a good um, situation to be in for anybody. Right. Well, and you combine that with people who are unhoused and you think, well, if, if you're unhoused and you don't have money for n not just shelter but all of these other things right. you, your health is going to deteriorate now you're burdening the healthcare system and i mean that's not to blame them for burdening the healthcare system that's right. to say our healthcare system is being strained to its limit right and how do we make sure that that's not happening well one solution is Let's make sure people have houses yes. make sure people are not living in conditions where they're becoming unhealthy precarious and yeah mm -hmm. um so okay let's talk about housing um there's something called the dogwood model yes that bc green party healthcare you mean oh sorry the healthcare. Yes. sorry we're flipped to healthcare. um so the dogwood model when you were talking about um strain on the healthcare system um how does that work like how would that alleviate the strain that we're seeing now on healthcare. Mm -hmm. So right now uh, we have people that are struggling to find doctors. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a family physician and I have for a long time. I know a lot of people don't. I don't, the NDP have put out statistics around how many people have them. But I don't know where they're coming from. I don't think they've explained that, but okay. um, they're, they're under the BC Liberals before them and under the BC NDP, people, people have been struggling with this. Mm -hmm. And it's not just finding a family physician, it's also like people like me who have one, we also have incredibly long wait times. There's, there's been times when I've had to wait two months just to get in to see a doctor, and then the issue's resolved by the time I actually uh, get in to see them. Or worsened for some Or worsened, some cases. that would be a worst case scenario, yeah. absolutely. So the idea of the Dogwood model is you have uh, community clinics. Mm -hmm. Every community has its own clinic. You can go there, you can book an appointment, uh, you can get in quickly, you can walk in perhaps. You can um, access those services instead of having to go to emergency. Because right now what happens is if you can't get in to see a family doctor and maybe the, the local clinic, or I think right now for our riding, the local clinic I go to is in Port Moody. It's not even in my riding, right? Because right? uh, that's the only walk-in area I can find. Okay. But we're overburdening those spaces. Mm -hmm. And so when you have a community clinic and you say, okay, this is our hub, we're going to expand or contract that depending on the size of the community that we're dealing with to make sure that those services are always accessible. That's sort of the concept behind the Dogwood model. Obviously, easier said than done, right? Because one of the problems we have is a lack of healthcare professionals. Right. And we're losing them for a variety of reasons. We're either not training enough or they're being paid more to go to other locations. Right. So that's another and side of the stress equation. stress in the healthcare system too that is, there is causing people to move away from it, right? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, we definitely have to address this from a multitude of different angles. But that is the concept behind the Dogwood model. Okay. And I think one of the things that is going to potentially take us away from being able to achieve that reality is these announcements by both the BC Conservatives and, and the NDP, is, is, like I mentioned before, flip-flopped on this involuntary care. Because, yeah, let's talk about that a little bit. Right. Yes. So the problem here is that we don't have facilities, not just for people to mm -hmm. receive care involuntarily, which means without consent. Right. It also means that, uh, or sorry, we also have a system where people who want voluntary care Cannot access can't access it. it. We don't even have those services. So why are we making this step to say, let's forcibly put people into care when we can't even take care well, of the people that want it? Bit of a leap, isn't it? Going from there's, it's hard to access services when you need them mm -hmm. to all of a sudden being involuntarily subjected to um, 
mm-hmm. you know, treatments and things. So what are you suggesting? Should we be putting resources somewhere else as well, not just into involuntary? Is there somewhere else that those resources should be going to? Well, I, I don't think we should be going the involuntary route, okay. uh, except for specific situations, right? Like we have that as we the have, Mental Health Act. Right? We do. We have yeah. some levels of involuntary care, mm-hmm. and those apply when people don't have the capacity, uh, the right. mental the capacity to make decisions for themselves and they have to be put there. But the changes that are being proposed here are that we're going to be now taking people who have mental health struggles that are not necessarily to the point where they don't have that capacity. We're taking people who have uh, drug addictions and we're saying, let's force you into care. And not only are we going to force them into care, but because we don't have the facilities to take care of them, we're going to force them into prisons. Into correctional institutions. We have guards taking care of them. And that's not care. That's not solving any issue. That's just locking the problem away. Exactly. Um, So does involuntary treatment work? Is there any evidence to show that it works? I I mean, I think from the perspective of if someone doesn't have the mental capacity, then Mm. what is the other option, right? Like they they don't have the ability to say yes or no, either way. So that's a special subset, I think, yeah. And I think I'm not an expert in the subject matter, but what I would do is direct your audience to uh, look up Kyla Lee. She's a criminal defense lawyer and she does a a really great uh, TikTok video on this where she talks about why this isn't just a bad decision, but it's also... uh, a violation of our charter rights. And, and it I, has been challenged previously when it was um, brought up, right? Mm-hmm, right, yeah. so like w- with, the, with the proposals of the BC Conservatives and the NDP now, I think there has to be a, a really long and hard look mm-hmm. at how this is going to be potentially violating people's charter right. rights because it's incredibly important that we're not stepping on people's toes in that way. We have these charter rights for a reason. We talked earlier about uh, the BC Human Rights Code as well. We have protections like these for a reason. So if a government can just come in and say, ah, disregard that, right? Right. What, what do they even mean at that and point? And what else are they going to disregard if this goes through? Yeah. Exactly. Who are they going to come for next? A lot of a lot of questions for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a conversation that I think we need to talk more about. Um, and I, I hope that it will continue and that there is more conversation around it. Mm-hmm. I just want to serve, I know we're covering so many things, <laughs> but I just want to circle back to housing for yes. um, just quickly. Is the NDP on the right track with the new provincial housing legislation? Like they have um, mandated minimum density requirements to mm-hmm. all municipalities over a population of 5,000. Um, is that the way to create healthy, climate ready? communities or is there something that the and that the green party would like to see changed i think it could be done uh in, in a good way i mm-hmm. so i'm not going to say i don't support that legislation mm-hmm. um I, I will say i don't think that it was done in consultation with the municipalities in a good way so a lot of municipalities are now feeling like they weren't consulted in this and they're now being told what to do. Right. And it's a blanket solution that doesn't take into account the nuances of various different communities. So I think that there's some criticism with that in mind. So more around the process rather than the actual legislation. Exactly. I think okay. the ultimate goal of let's make sure we have this additional density and that we're creating more units for people to live in. I think that that at its core is, is good, okay. right? So I don't have an issue with that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it, it is that consultation piece. I think there's probably locations where the province has said, you know, in this location you have to put a six unit prop or a six unit building on a single what what is currently now a single family home property. Right. And that might not fit with a specific location. In a neighborhood it, with the infrastructure, there's right. lots of different, yeah. And I don't want to speculate about you know right. where that might be. I'm right. just saying that could potentially be an mm-hmm. issue and that's why it's important that those consultations happen ahead of time. Um, but I think there's also other me- measures that we can take, right? Um, that alone is not going to solve our housing crisis. Okay. So I think we need to look at things like mandating numbers of affordable units within new, new construction. This is um, more of a municipal issue right. because municipalities um, are generally in, in the habit of mandating various requirements when it comes to new builds. But I think that's a really important one. Coquitlam, for instance, uh, we have a cap on building heights right. and it's uh, by measurement. It's not by story. And, and uh, or sorry, it's by story, not by measurement. Okay. So what that means is that if you're putting in a high rise, it's much more um, profitable for a developer to want to put in 
10 right, foot ceilings to, as opposed to eight foot ceilings yeah. because they get the same amount of stories that they're allowed to have, right. but their buildings taller, those units because they have taller ceilings sell will sell for, for more. more. But yes. creating luxury condos isn't how we get ourselves out of the affordability right. crisis, okay. right? So things like that can change. I think there needs to be conversations with municipalities around that. And I think also when it comes to like property values mm -hmm. more broadly, this applies to commercial real estate as well. Mm -hmm. And the costs that are being passed along to renters in commercial spaces, right? If you're a small business owner and you're trying to start a business in Coquitlam, you're going to look at the rental prices and go, how the heck am I supposed right. to afford this, right? How, how do I start a business in this city? Well, one of the problems is that we have something called triple net leases, which okay. is where, let's say you have a, uh, a property that's zoned for a, a one story, uh, let's use McDonald's on Austin Avenue as an example, because okay. we're talking local, right? So the McDonald's on Austin Avenue, that was rezoned for a 25 story high rise. So when you rezone a property for a 25 story high rise, that doesn't mean one's going to get built immediately. Right. But what it does mean is that the taxes on that oh, are going to kick I in immediately. Right. Well, okay. the owner of that property has seen a huge windfall. Their property right. values have gone way up, right? Right. But they don't see that until they sell it. Right. So in their mind, it's reasonable to pass those expenses along to the renter. But in, the renter hasn't seen any value. They still oh, have just a one-story building. They just, okay. their business is exactly the same. But now they're being hit because for some reason this is legal with a massive fee. And I believe for the McDonald's, uh, the owner had said it was something like an extra $75,000 a year. So well, significant. Right. Try to make your business wow. work if you're having to now pay an extra $75,000 a so year. this is one of those things that maybe where it could be fine-tuned to make sure that doesn't happen. Right? Well, I don't think triple net leases should exist at mm -hmm. all because there's no reason why that owner should have to pass right. along those expenses. They can suck it up until they're willing to sell. And I say this as a property owner myself. Mm -hmm. If I see a huge windfall, if my property values go way up, right. I, I don't think it's fair to say, okay, well, that now needs to be passed along to someone right. else. That's like having my cake and eating it too, yes. right? I won the lottery and now I want to tax someone else for my lottery winnings. Totally get it. Nicola, is there anything else you want to um, touch on before we wrap up here? I think our, our time is coming to a close. Wrap oh, sure. Here. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think there's a lot to touch on. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of difficult for me to focus on one specific area. We we didn't talk a lot about the environment. Um, and, I, you know, obviously at the Green Party, you probably, your audience probably already knows that that's something that we're strong on. But there are a lot of issues that I think are important in this election that are going to come out in the BC Green Party's platform shortly. So I would say stay tuned to bcgreens.ca for that information. And also my personal website, uh, nicholasferling.me. Okay. Um, dot M-E. Dot M-E, okay. like me. Um, and that would be where you could go to find more information about what I personally stand for. And uh, I'll also share information about the party there. Thank you so much for joining us. I know we covered a huge amount of um, territory in a very short time, so I appreciate you taking the time coming in and talking to us. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you so much for joining us. This is We've Got Issues, and we've been speaking with Nicola Sperling, who is the BC Green candidate for Coquitlam Millardville.